Welcome to Cross Border Conversations, a Stir original video series that features conversations between thought leaders across countries and across creative dis disciplines. The format is very simple. It is an easy flowing chat between the two people who can be imagined as sitting in their drawing room, only a virtual one, or they've just met each other in a cafe and over a cup of coffee. They're absorbed in moments of revelation in each other's life's journeys, professional journeys, personal journeys, their stories, their anecdotes, their experiences, their inspirations and their insights. And yes, as they talk to each other, they share their work. They talk to each other and give us those insights and inspirations which have made them reach where they have reached in the professional life today. For the first episode of Cross Border Conversation, we welcome Ayaz Basrai and Atha Mamao Mani. Ayaz is the co-founder at the Basrai Design Studio, an architecture in India design firm from Mumbai. And he heads the Basrai Lab, which is studio's research arm based in Goa. He defines his practice as something that looks for solutions from macro to micro, from slightly mad to totally insane. From conceiving some of India's trendiest hotels, fascinating homes and remarkable workplaces, to hemming research-centric work on heritage conservation and speculative design. Ayaz's practice knows no bounds. As a kid, Ayaz had a BMX with a steering wheel, which he almost killed himself many a times, as he, as he jokingly told us. Bus ride was his name in ragging at the design school. That later became his first email address and eventually the studio name, once he, along with his father and brother Zameer, started working together all sharing what Ayaz calls the unholy version of their surname. Ayaz values polyvalence above all else, which he defines as the idea of breaking down any singular narrative into spectrum of possibilities, exploring the fringes of things and complicating conversations. This is where the bus ride lab comes into picture and his interest in futures and in speculative fictions and stories he narrates through his practices. Welcome Ayaz. Proud to have you on the first episode of Cross Border Conversation. Arthur Mao Money, director of London based Mao Money Limited, Arthur specializes in digitally designed and digitally fabricated architecture, custom products, and interfaces built using robotic and virtual reality tools. An architect and an educator, he believes in innovation, craft, and evolving architecture's role in society by utilizing new technologies. Some of his projects include a stunning bioplastic installation called Conifera from Milan Design Week in 2019, the monumental temple Galaxia from Burning Man 2018, and a virtual avatar of an installation that he initially designed for the Burn 2020. He's extremely fond of India. He has been to the country once a few years back, and he cherishes, cherishes his memories of exploring Matra Mandir and city of Aruval with his students. Arthur got married to the love of his life during his time in Black Rock City while he was building the Temple Galaxia there in 2018. That's some story, Arthur. Stir is happy to have you on board today as the first episode of Cross Product Conversation. I leave Arthur and Ayaz now to share, talk to each other, and while they converse and they get to know and imbibe into each other's practices, we watch them inspire us. Thank you. you Thank you very much, Amit. <laughs> that's fun. That's true. True fact. But I got married after we finished the construction. Okay. It was a bit safer, <laughs> not during. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. And so you had BMX bikes. Is that is that right? Or yeah, I mean, growing up, and then uh, I think what I what the the fun thing was mm. uh, I kind of uh, got a old uh, ambassador steering wheel. So we kind of got rid of the handles and put a steering wheel on, uh, which seemed like a really cool idea then. Uh, <laughs> but, then but then when you cycle, your legs go out at 45 degrees because you can't really, you know, I mean, it's really shit design. <laughs> oh, really? Was it made of bamboo or something? <laughs> Yeah, we um, when we worked on on Galaxia, you know that um, everyone is with a bike at Burning Man, yeah. so the whole architecture is really influenced by the the, the way people use the bicycle, whether it's uh, the way they store them, the way they uh, they put them on site, or the way you kind of understand distance completely changes 
because you measure it in relation to your modes of transportation, right? Yeah. So, and even the uh, the whole foundation of the of the temple was based on a bike wheel. Oh wow! Yeah. Yeah. So that was the that was the center of the project. So the whole project was uh, made with what we call the petals, or it became bananas because burning burning man like people there are quite funny, and I think we were just very tired, so we developed. The whole language of our own but uh, so the bananas were sort of held in place with this giant bike wheel and I, I remember when the engineer suggested wow. that uh, my colleague was like Arthur have you ever assembled a bike wheel you'll know how hard it is to get all the spokes to be at the same spot and uh, luckily for everyone I'd never assembled a bike wheel and so <laughs> I took the risk to do it and I'm glad because it actually was simpler than we thought you know um, not the whole project, just that bit wasn't too scary. But uh, yeah, that shows the, the scaffolding and all the bits that we had to think of uh, for the project because everything was done. We were on site. We were the general contractor for the project. Um, and when I say this, I say this in a naive way. Like we were basically just managing a bunch of uh, uh, of people from all backgrounds and skills. And uh, these are the guys you see. And so I think general contractor is a, it's a bit too professional for what happened actually as a characteristic. <laughs> <laughs> and so when it, when it came to that bit, I thought it was very symbolic. I mean, the whole project is obviously full of symbolism, um, mm -hmm. but the, the idea that, you know, everything was structural, that there wasn't any decoration, you see, like every element was a reflection of the people assembling it. And the fact that uh, it was made from a very uh, simple piece of wood you see like off the shelf timber so that there wasn't any uh, noble so to speak material or there wasn't any columns or um, you know usually architecture is seen as a uh, you have the columns and we always celebrate the columns and and then you have like the sort of decorative elements and stuff like that and uh, and this one was the opposite like everything was um, everything was structure everything was sort of truthful in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, you see the benches here at the back where people will later on place all their bikes and so on. So, and that's, that's, that's the, the wedding bit. I might as well show it since we <laughs> talked about it. <laughs> you, you, you can't, you can't, you can't hear it, but we're singing all you need is love. And, uh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. That was, that was the, that was my mom and, and, uh, you know, my colleague Maya and my sister, and it was it was quite quite something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard that you're, and I saw that you're, kind of like us, not so conventional. Uh, but that's kind of interesting. I'm I'm curious to hear how, where do you fit in that equation? <laughs> so some of this began, uh, you know, when uh, a while ago we started mapping the year 2035. Right. So that was like this sort of a studio project, like trying to figure out this large interconnected web, which uh, allows like uh, allows you to map simultaneity, you know, allows you to map kind of adjacencies, uh, which is different from a more uh, like in design school. At least I studied in a 60s modernist kind of design school. So there it's fairly form follows function and, you know, things flow linearly. Uh, so this was a big, uh, you know, a massive like uh, mind storm. You know, about like, uh, how do you think in networks and not in flowcharts, you know, things like that. Um, so we started mapping out the year 2035. And in that, there were lots of these emerging adjacencies. So, you know, if we could see the future of gender along with the future of fashion or the future of food along with the gender of, let's say, the future of computation, for example. So, I mean, uh, one could actually then mix and match uh, depending on what node you choose to connect to what other node. Uh, so the only way of making sense of all that chaos is really to kind of pick up small small experiments uh, and play them out more as uh, I mean in that sense it's like stand up comedy you know you you find up find one instance and then explore the whimsy and the eccentricity around it. Um, so some of that output is really in, in speculative fiction I mean it's these sort of small scenarios and the thing is then those typically build into other projects so it could it could become a dish on a menu or it could become like a small experiment at the beach in Goa. There's uh, one project we're trying to do with this uh, chef who's uh, Bombay based. Uh, he's like an old friend. He's uh, uh, name, his name is Chef Gresham Fernandez. And okay. we're trying to figure out like the future of food, uh, but uh, used mostly as provocation. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were trying to, I mean, he's trying to do a couple of dishes based on these speculative fiction. So one of the things was a cow cooked in its own methane. 
you know, essentially uh, like a steak that's cooked for two and a half years uh, with over like, you know, maybe 12,000, uh, uh, sorry, 12 million liters of methane, uh, which is wow. the amount that the same cow produces uh, as part of the sort of food industry. Uh, oh, so it's cooked, it's cooked with the cow's own methane. Yeah. I mean, so we, were, we worked with a, we did a, a restaurant where the food was 3D printed and this was kind of done with a, um, a chef from, an old chef from El Bulli, you know, the, the restaurant oh, in, yeah, in, in Catalonia in where, yeah. yeah, they did the molecular food. And, uh, yeah. and what was interesting is they got interested in the potential of 3D printing food because once you do molecular, the next step is to actually not just work with the material, but also the way you deposit that material. Yeah. And so um, we, and because we were developing G code for, uh, for three D printing, I have a, a print next to me, for example, that is made with that technique of generating the toolpath. Um, you can kind of change parameters as you print, so you can print and suddenly uh, do things like that. You see, uh, where you string the inside, and you can accelerate, wow. decelerate, and like droop things. And, and so, the idea was that um, we could do this with food. Um, I mean, I could kind of bring you around a little bit since, since we're going to move around the space, but uh, let me bring a few things. <laughs> I got lots of stuff around me, but well, you see, for example, can, here, yeah. yeah. So we're accelerating um, like mm -hmm. the way it kind of sticks out and therefore, I don't know if it's very kind of focused, but you create like chaos. You, know, you talked about chaos, like <laughs> lack of control. Uh, lovely, with yeah. with kind of time, yeah, exactly. So, you're so messing with the you, machine. You're messing with the machine. Like that's a good way to say <laughs> it. Where did you? Uh, I mean, where all did you travel in India? The first year we went to more like the south, uh, Oroville. Um, oh, wow. How was yeah. Oroville? Uh, incredible. Yeah, incredible. really incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was a big inspiration, really. And we were lucky to have the visit from, uh, we visited the, 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 the city council and they explained the whole master plan and like how it, uh, it organized itself, how successful and also how like mm. unsuccessful like in a sense that people just did whatever they wanted uh which is very different from uh what they planned they wanted seventy thousand people and uh yeah it actually just 5, 000, uh, right? yeah five thousand exactly and it didn't really follow this galactic master mm. plan but it was really interesting to hear that and for our students to see how it got taken over by nature and trees and so on yeah <laughs> it's yeah. incredible like i mean when you go there you realize you're in the middle of like this jungle because uh so we, we did mm. a lot of work there and, oh really uh, oh nice some of my yeah and so, some some actually some clients used to live in the middle of the jungle in Oroville. so yeah. uh, yes. uh when oh, we wow. went to meet Amazing. when i went to meet them it was like uh you know they were saying every single tree that you see around here is uh planted by man like nothing is incredible uh, nothing existed before that so it's a full yeah. regeneration project incredible that's probably its biggest success really uh, yeah. I can totally see yeah. the parallels between, uh, like you mentioned, Oroville. I can totally see the parallels between, uh, you know, why you would find a kind of, you know, parallel between that. In fact, it's so strange. Like, uh, you know, I've got this on my notes that, you know, uh, uh, seeing your work and, you know, just kind of, you know, understanding the grammar of the burning, uh, the Burning Man experience. It, it seems like this sort of commitment to excellence, right? It's like a, it's like celebrating the way humans can be, uh, and uh, that's really this abiding. A kind of a thought that you even get uh, when you read Aurobindo or you read, uh, you know, the kind of, uh, uh, he says something really beautiful about Aurobindo. He says, you know, it's not the first Aurobindo and it will not be the last. So I think uh, for him, uh, the, the act of settling Aurobindo wasn't really a validation. It was, you know, that he was seeing it iteratively. I mean, he was saying that this is the first experiment and there will be more Aurobindo and there will be, you know, uh, he wasn't really committing to it in a in a particular geography or a particular time. Yeah, it's a dream, right? Really and, uh, yeah, you're completely right. And, and I, I read the uh, you know Yonah Friedman, the Israeli architect that did um, the sort of giant. Uh, he he unfortunately passed away recently, but he was really pro utopia, and he said that he's very disappointed when people 
uh, see utopia in a sort of dystopian way where they think that uh, because it's uh, imagination, because it will confront itself with reality and the humans are uh, often taking something that could be positive and, and make a mess out of it, we should stop dreaming. We should stop thinking that there could be a, a better world or a place in which we can you know, realize things in a better way or improve society. And, I, you know, so I really commend initiatives like Oroville or, or Burning Man, where I would say it might be easier if it's only, you know, for a week. I think Oroville struggled with its own permanence. Yeah, <laughs> and any, any uh, you know, any commune or any, any kind of permanent attempt to do utopia is, is way harder than a temporary. So I think in any way, in many ways, Burning Man has, yeah. by being temporary enabled maybe more innovation to some extent but you know Oroville is still magical it's still I feel uh, you know it's got so much working for it uh, and you know even if you take off the uh, the you know the the master planning and you take off all of that like it's still uh, in individual homes like we were there for like uh, for for 10 days and uh, my wife uh, she's a she's a nut about paper so uh, she was doing this paper workshop there and uh, it's just, you know, just that act of three days of making paper. Uh, it's so transformative because like these guys are, you know, have been there their entire lives just making paper. And it's a way of working on their own personalities. Really, the city is the manifestation of you working on your own self. You know, it's a... Uh, oh, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. I, I remember having a a sort of sound healing session uh, with the students. So all of us kind of in that room healing the... The, the 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 music they were literally playing sounds and instruments and we were feeling it uh and for an architect to think that you can feel sounds i thought that was quite a powerful moment i mean i completely fell asleep and uh, you know only remember half of it but i just remember being in a state where you know it's it's so unusual to to feel the vibrations of, of, of the sound. And, you know, it's funny, I, I, I might uh, kind of, you know, from being at Burning Man and, and Bur Oroville, I, I, I sound like a complete hippie. Um, but I always, I, I, was, I was brought up by a, a very scientific person at, a, you know, a computer science uh, um, father and, a, and my mom who was uh, into ecology and the concept of, um, uh, protecting the environment that was something that was very foreign to my dad and um, and so I grew up in between two religions and two views of society uh, uh, you know the the, the hardcore the, the, the finance and then the sort of ethics the, the, the computer science and then the sort of um, alternative sciences and 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 in those places are interesting to see with two perspectives you know and and to come with a um, our architect uh, teachers hat and it's a very thorough I mean Westminster is a wonderful university where I teach and to bring our students there it was great to hear their thoughts on it you know um, rather than come with people that are already convinced by by this or, or to go to Burning Man like I, I've never been to any similar event, and I, I was kind of more of a geek you know like teaching grasshopper to my students on Saturdays and 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 then uh, my 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 co-teacher he was building boats so it was a it was from a very different uh, kind of making background and 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 so that really helped I think always having someone that thinks very differently from you opens up worlds you know and we it's often our comfort zone to be with people that think like us you know um so I I, I don't know why I'm saying all this but <laughs> <laughs> I guess it opened up the conversation. How is it in Goa? Like, how you, you must be—it must be full of, uh, of of people that come to change their life, right? Yeah. So I mean, uh, you know, Goa is uh, also very, very interesting. Uh, and uh, I mean, obviously, open invitation—you need to come here whenever you're here next. Uh, and uh, you know, in in many ways, uh, when we were shifting, so we shifted from Bombay, and uh, one of the two, one of the, there were two places that were on the radar to shift to. One was uh, Orville, and one was Goa. So really, uh, you know, uh, we kind of, you know, did a lot of uh, thinking and we kind of settled on Goa because uh, it's got uh, it's got a very, very nice energy. You know, it's got a lot of people who are trying to remake their own lives with, you know, uh, detoxifying a little bit. Uh, you know, a lot of people you meet are growing their own, you know, growing their own produce and uh, starting to build their own homes. And, you know, so it's got uh, that sense of self-reliance as well. Um, 
again in pockets i mean it needs to be sorted out uh, and uh, i think it's got a lot more of the i, I think it's got a lot of younger energy than uh, what what we felt at audible so i think it sort of felt a bit more our speed i asked why you on goa subject why don't you share a few things about um i just saw your instagram post which you had done today uh, on the generative pavilion for beach belt in goa which you're doing um it'll be interesting for author also to know and the audience also to know what you're doing yeah, so we're trying out a whole bunch of different just generative forms and uh, the idea was to kind of you know uh, interpret these as replacements for a lot of the plastic stuff that you see on beaches right yeah. uh, we're surrounded by a whole bunch of um, essentially mm. you know uh debris from pepsi and coca cola that uh, find their way to the beach so one of the ideas was to kind of use uh, interesting sort of form- formats for yeah. you know sun beds parasols uh, because uh, i guess within uh, grasshopper you can actually get a lot more performative uh, surfaces like you know you're able to then uh, you know work your uh, solar response and all of that so uh, one of the ideas was to kind of you know explore that side of uh, you know digital creation but use them for very simple structures which could be uh, you know just uh, quickly put up on the beach and it sort of ties in a little bit mm-hmm. with uh, just uh, you know there's a tribal we a uh, tribal weaver community in this uh, small forest uh, very close it's around 40 minutes from the most commercial beach in goa uh, it's a, it's this beautiful village called koti gaon and uh, the women there do this uh, traditional uh, coconut leaf uh, weaving so we were there like 3 uh, 4 months ago to kind of document uh that process and the idea was if we can create scaffoldings uh you know using uh, sort of you know forms that are conceived of in uh, rhino and grasshopper one could actually give them those scaffoldings in the village and uh, you know create uh, generative weaves it's funny you say that cuz i feel like you know we because we use grasshopper we have this sort of edge uh in technology and and like we're kind of uh we're able to do fairly complex stuff a, a little bit faster and maybe lose control also a little bit faster yeah. and uh, and this idea of of losing control i always found really beautiful and uh the idea of having like a craftsman or uh, you know these crafts uh women that you did you you mentioned that mm-hmm. did those weaves i i'm almost a kind of and i'm sure you're the same but like i almost wonder like how much do we do on grasshopper and how much we need to learn from them like absolutely, and I, I, my feeling is more if i if i met them i would be like can we make them lose control just like we lose control when we use parametric software and uh, could we kind of I, i kind of don't even want to, to touch my laptop i'm almost tempted to say okay teach me uh, how to how to do it and let's do it together and then let absolutely, the yeah. you sure. know let let that growth happen yeah. with our hands absolutely before we start putting it in the computer because then whatever we'll end up doing in a computer will be deeply informed by yeah by that right yeah absolutely i uh, know and i i i really feel you know so one of the things that we were uh, that we we did think about was to kind of do two experiments like two mirrored experiments and they both start from the opposite ways Uh, mm-hmm. so one sort of begins in grasshopper and uh, you know is then taken to the village the, the one begins in the village and is then taken into computation so uh, and then uh, you sort of the, you know you you kind of do almost a vivi section of each project and uh, you sort of then see uh, where it stops being uh, you know generated where it starts becoming uh, you know convinced uh, sort of conceived in the rural and uh, you may actually hit upon a slice in time where it's both So uh, yeah, I I like that cuz we we I mean I love Grasshopper when it surprises me like I, I think I'd be <laughs> I'd be I'd be so bored if uh if I knew what I wanted you know like I I think I you know we laugh here in the office cuz I I think um most of the time I don't know what I want like and and I think that's a, a good thing because that otherwise how boring would it be for everyone right cuz you go to people you work with people you always do things that are certain and um i find it's really interesting that everyone discovers at the same time and that where um that process of discovery i find is as much with the craft as it is but often when you're a craftsman you're used to doing conventions right you do a basket and then it has to be a certain type of basket and i think if anything we can be the ones that with a naivety a certain sense of naivety we can be the ones that push to let go of our certitudes and 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 create that creative spark in a way you know in that sense uh you know this is a it's a very very deeply human activity 
Um, so I think therein lies the sensitivity also because typically digital tools tend to uh, give you extremely finished products extremely fast. I mean, at least in terms of the visualization. And this is something we're struggling with internally as well, you know, that how do you keep the finish away from looking like something that uh, is already kind of locked in time, you know, and then, uh, so we, so one of the ways of thinking about it is to think about it as scaffoldings, you know, that you have, uh, say, uh, it's a structure in becoming, it's a, stru it's a structure which is not yet become. And uh, which is, to my mind, what is magical about what a lot, a lot of authors work like. It, it's got like, uh, it's got the sense of a scaffolding. Like I love something you said about, uh, uh, about, I think you, I think this is about amphitheaters. You were talking about uh, like if a city is built by everyone, then what's the need of the amphitheater anyway? It's such a beautiful manifesto for a city, right? I mean, if a city has that kind of performative or that kind of uh, quality where everyone is invested in the making of that city, then you don't actually technically need amphitheaters, which are you know, given to you by the city to then, uh, you to know, get, be it. entertained. Yeah. And, for, and forget, <laughs> yeah. right. That's what the Roman did. Like we're going to do the game so that everyone, you know, yeah. forget, forgets. <laughs> right. And, and, and you can keep the power and in a way, because Burning Man is meant to have everyone or to give power to everyone who, what do you entertain for? And what's the concept of entertainment then? Or, it's not to forget. It's actually, you are part of it. It's an engaging process, an empowering process. Yeah. Um, so that was, exclusion. exactly. <laughs> and, but that's, a, I think it's a beautiful concept yeah. because it re-questions our, um, our categories in life. Like, you know, there is, we live in such a highly specialized world. And, um, and I don't know if you probably read the uh, Buckminster Fuller and yeah, the, the operating manual for Spaceship yeah. Earth, where he says <laughs> that, you know, at the time, like uh, everyone had a sort of uh, general curiosity uh, or a general uh, kind of take on many aspects, right? You were sort of in charge of, uh, or you were kind of involved in the building of your home. You were involved in, the, in many aspects of your life. You would grow your food or you would, a majority of people were connected to the elements that they were consuming to some extent, even, um, and, then, and then we sort of lost track and people got so specialized that we, like right now I'm in an office and I'm in front of a computer, but we, we, we wouldn't have that when you talked about craftsmen, you were, uh, people are connected with their craft, right? They, they're on a daily basis connected to the material. They have this intelligence of, of, of working with, with things. So they, 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 they have this conversation with what it is that they're building. Yeah. And even if you were to, to go and, and buy something, you would see the craftsmen. So you would have a direct kind of relationship with the maker of that thing. You wouldn't have this in-between middleman that just sells the product and doesn't necessarily know how this product is made. So you had a more direct relationship with the origin of things, of, of, of where things come from. And, yeah. and then we kind of completely in a globalized world sort of outsource and puts factories in, in, in China or, and so forth. And so we lost track with the making. And, and then after that, you know, with, with things like the printing or the, or the, uh, you know, the, the, the parameters tool there is a convergence of, um, of, of of what used to be specialization but that need to work together because the structure and I, you talked about the environmental aspect the structural simulation all these things need to talk to each other because when you then run things like a genetic algorithm you need the parametric system to be optimized by that and to create a, a, a sort of complete parametric model all the we professions were, uh, need so to come we, together. We, we were struggling for a long time with the definition of craft, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, when you actually, uh, you know, uh, start thinking about it, uh, craft is a fairly deeply human activity, right? It's something that we've been doing since the beginning of uh, humanity. And uh, what we realized is that, especially in India, like uh, I think uh, also to uh, Amit's point, you know, that uh, craft, uh, you know, very fast, it gets seen as artifact. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, like, in the pub, in in the popular imagination, craft is uh, an artifact that is usually produced in a village or a rural kind of uh, atmosphere somewhere. It's uh, fairly linked with agriculture. Uh, you know, it's a circular ecosystem. It's got all the sort of ethos of uh, you know uh, like a very very uh, sort of ecologically sensitive uh, kind of a practice. But uh, we don't look at it to solve uh, you know twenty first century problems. You know, uh, what we normally look at is a craft is has to be something that either has to be saved or protected or, you know, uh, in some sense, like fetishized uh, in a museum uh, rather than it uh, being deployed today and tomorrow to kind of, you know, be a big part of, say, the aerospace program or a big part of the, you know, uh, like the country's imagination of the future of building, for example. 
Um, so one of the things that we actually uh, tried, I'll just show you something really quick. Uh, so we so we started, uh, you know, we thought we should address this issue uh, by building a game, right? Uh, so let's uh, let's say that uh, there are a bunch of different practitioners who all call themselves uh, craft prof uh, craft prof uh, sorry craftsmen, and yeah. uh, they are actually defined as craftsmen because they share a set of values. Uh, they're not uh, craftsmen because they're producing a particular artifact. So uh, in this definition, uh, whether you're working with algorithm or DNA or leather, uh, your value system is really uh, what um, allows you to be known as a craftsman rather than uh, so I mean to my mind uh, you guys will be digital craftsmen right uh, where uh, your tools are essentially binary and uh, you know bits and pieces of code and uh, you know the end output is obviously you know this uh, all these objects of exquisite beauty and uh, I mean uh, so there are these kind of you know different uh, you know paradigms in which uh, one could look at uh, you know the idea of community, where uh, crafts as a practice forges community. You know it, it's able to uh, create uh, like which uh, so say for example industrial processes don't end up doing, right? Like so uh, if uh, so I mean one could reframe uh, the definition of craft by making it a lot more accessible and a lot more inclusive, and uh, people are able to actually find their own path uh, within this kind of thing. So one of the things that we really want to do is to produce this game. Uh, as a board game that allows you to also kind of, uh, you know, assess your own practice, essentially, like you're able to, uh, because in India, like a lot of the crafts collaborations uh, are actually glorified slave labor, you know, you're, uh, it's normally like, a, you know, some sort of a fairly point, like it's normally like in, you know, uh, 60s India, where there was the last set of inspirations that existed for us as a nation. Uh, in when we were you know, nation building, you know, there was all the the age of Chandigarh and the age of, you know, Corbusier mm. in India, that whole time, uh, yeah. post independence. And uh, post that, we've been pretty much in the, in the dark ages uh, where architecture has come mm. from. That's really interesting so think, uh, you say that. Yeah. The, 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 um, the idea that craft freezes thing or the idea that craft is fetishized and therefore loses because craft is is a is is almost like a philosophy right like when you when you craft it means that you're able to understand the technique and that that technique is informing what you're doing and you become a craftsman yeah. through uh like doing similar tasks and improving your task over time and and then kind of creating something even more uh informed by that craft right it's a it's a conversation with materials and technique that's what crafts are but if you are then fetishizing, then it's no longer craft. It becomes sort of mass production or something that is no longer um, the act of crafting, but the act of just productifying and then selling yeah. a product and then finding the cheapest labor. And then, and so therefore, it's no longer the positive philosophical aspect of craft, but the, uh, the, the sort of commercialized and, and, and more capitalistic aspect of craft. And, 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 and I think that's um, a beautiful thing. I mean, we're talking cross-border conversation uh, in that I have a sort of naivety towards, I guess, any other culture than mine. And, uh, and I was telling Amit about my first client who uh, came to me uh, fascinated by Vashtu and uh, the, the oh, sacred. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, and, so let me just show you something else. Uh, I mean, you know, this is... Um, uh, so this is uh, the Goan version of Angkor Wat, right? Uh, you have uh, nice. <laughs> so you have monuments like this. Uh, this is uh, so something uh, you know. I think uh, in the beginning, uh, you know, some of our work is uh, in heritage conservation, mm. but uh, we try to engage with it again in a slightly tangential way, right? So uh, the point is that we kind of partner with people who are doing the uh, the conservation project, but uh, we uh, and also partner with you know like-minded studios who are doing heavy research. So because archives about Goa exist in Goa and in Portugal, so and in the in the Portuguese archives they're in uh, you know so you need to actually have a partnership with research partners in Portugal and Goa to get a complete picture of what uh, the Goan history is actually. And you know uh, so on the top you see like uh, that's the entire ruin that was covered up by jungle completely, and uh, you know it's anyone's guess whether uh, beauty was. Uh, added or taken away by clearing the jungle. You know, it's uh, jewelry still out on that one. And uh, this is what, so this is what we do. We kind of you know uh, you know create like um, uh, so yeah. So we did a photogrammetry uh, kind of a, a drone shot over the whole temple uh, to extract like a three dimensional uh, sort of a wire mesh uh, from the temple itself uh, from the church itself. 
and then you can actually start building it out in VR, right? So uh, the idea was to kind of then build uh, scaffoldings which create a, a, a the volume of the cathedral, uh, and uh, it's sort of used in VR. And the idea is that if, if, uh, essentially the jungle takes over. You know, your uh, the sort of uh, jungle comes back and starts growing over the uh, monument, which then creates your cathedral-like experience, but it's still a chapel in the outdoors. And uh, to sort of popularize that, obviously, we put, put out a lot of fake news. Like it was sort of, you know, Photoshop <laughs> on top of, <laughs> sort of, you know, that this uh, heritage park is now celebrating Christmas and there are kids coming and singing carols. And, you know, this is like an outdoor film festival venue now. And then to raise money for the thing, we kind of made small, you know, sort of donor kits, which it's a sort of Kickstarter style crowdfunding campaign. So <laughs> when you... Uh, when you start, uh, you know, when you support the cause, you get a small model in, in place. <laughs> I, I love this. I love the, the fake news spreading. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, we do, we do a lot of fake news. <laughs> nice. Positive. <laughs> positive may, fake news. May, yeah, yeah. Artistic face, fake news. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. I like how you're, uh, you're in between imagination and reality. It's a, it's, it's a nice place to be at to make people dream. Yeah, it's a, um, it makes me think of the, the whole thing with catharsis, like a, a whole event canceled and us like putting it in VR. And, um, mm. you know, I have some funny pictures actually as well, since you shared your... And you years. guys collaborated with a game design studio as well, right? So what happened is we, uh, we made a, you know, we have a, a guy here who's uh, really good with Unity, actually Krishna uh -huh. from, from, from India. And he's, uh, Unity is a game engine. Yeah, and uh, and the game engine is uh, is not online, right? Like, so yeah. it's not like we could do multiplayer interactions where a lot of people can come to our building, which is what matters, right? Or interact right. online. Yeah. And so all you can do is to do a Unity build, a Unity build, and then people click on it and then they access it, but they're within their computers. They still have to load the entire thing. So we were looking for game designers to create an online experience that is multiplayer. I discovered that there is something called the, the metaverse, which is the idea that the internet in the future won't be just a browser-based thing. It will be a, a physical, interactive world in which you're kind of entering a market with your VR goggles or, and you're kind of you know, going around. The, so the, the, the boundary between physical space and digital space will be really blurred. And um, I find this fascinating. And I thought, well, as architect, that's, wow, that's... That's kind of interesting. We should probably get started with this. And so we made that call for action. And then we started receiving uh, um, emails from uh, people that already had quite, I mean, they have advanced quite a lot. Like, so this is, for example, just to show you, this is just filming the Unity build. Um, so very, very precise. Uh, you know, you can walk around, but you're in your computer and you're kind of playing around, but you cannot meet people. So you're very lonely. So it's very high res, but very lonely. Um, and but it's you can see you can make effects with the lights, and it's you don't need to think wow. of the of the uh, the, uh, the, the high res the high resness of your mesh, if I may say. And um, so this was amazing. I mean, we could do amazing renders, and this is not renders. These oh, are this is off screen. Unity. This is off Unity. So this wow. is literally a print screen of Unity, right? That's insane. And, and it felt even more real than the real thing. And it was just, wow, that's pretty, because it wasn't as nearly as perfect as this in real life, you know. Uh, Alexia was like full of, you know, ratchet strap and stuff like that. Uh, I'm, I'm almost shy to show you, but. And I guess uh, you could uh, directly port from Grasshopper into Unity, right? I mean, as an OBJ or something. So uh, I think you have to use things like FBX. Uh, so I don't know that there is a Grasshopper plugin for it. Um, it would be amazing if there were a better kind of relationship between them. But these are all from this I really like because it's like the Phoenix, you know, coming back from the ashes, Galaxia being rebuilt, and then Catharsis is the other project. So we could have two projects in the same. That's in amazing. fact, we had, we had three of them. And this is, this is the, uh, the alt space. So alt space is way more low res, as you can see. Mm -hmm. uh, but alt space is a way to take people um, multiplayers there I can have many people and that's an avatar of someone else playing the xylophone you know so you can play things you can have interactions 
So it's really a proper world like the internet that people can go to and a physical version of it. You can take selfies. Here you go. And, uh, <laughs> and so that was, that was a really, really nice solution. However, extremely low res, kind yeah. of funny because that's like, say that's my colleague Andros, like, and, but what's really amazing is because you have your VR goggles, you're not on your PC, you can feel your scale in relation to the object. So I had some cool. side visits. That's me. That's my avatar. And we had side visits with people like, um, you know, for example, a donor, you talk about fundraising. We had a donor who came to visit it and he said, well, that's the first time I can feel my scale in relation to the project. And that, I thought that was very powerful because he could feel his, his scale in relation to it. And so when you think of, of architecture and rendering, you don't really, you're, it's two dimensional, right? Yeah, you see absolutely. a screen. You don't. So I think there is a few real revolution for architects in this world. Uh, of um, of VR and 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 metaverse and and it was just uh, at the beginning. I guess to start building differently, right? Because uh, here there's no gravity. <laughs> right? like, That's so, true. There's another gravity, which is the the memory of the of the computer, right? Like if you yeah. go past the the everything crashes in a different way. <laughs> One of the things that we're doing uh, is also working with uh, a few collaborators on a video game. It's uh, this, uh, you know, uh, it's actually probably one of the first few video games out of India in digital industry produced. Uh, you have to check it out. It's called Antarik Sanchar. Uh, I'll send you a link uh, maybe after the uh, post the call. It's this really, really incredible uh, adventure set in this sort of a temple town in South India. And uh, so I'm, I'm kind of, you know, uh, working on some concept art and some kind of product design for that game. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we realized uh, when we, we did a little part of that thing in VR, like, uh, but we were working on Unreal. And uh, All right. uh, so uh, we, uh, we got the speeds wrong, you know, so essentially uh, when you're walking, in the game, you're walking a lot faster, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the Oculus. And uh, there was this, uh, the mother of one of our uh, students, uh, she came in uh, to experience what she had done. And it was obviously a really quick and dirty build, right? Two weeks of just like uh, sort of kit bashing stuff from here and there. <laughs> and uh, it was really, really badly put together. And she actually, she vomited because, uh, you know, the, there's this proper real motion sickness that you feel, right? If you don't get the speeds right. Uh, mm. So she, I mean, you had a proper physical reaction in virtual world, you know, it was, it was really, really, uh, you know, that you don't have gravity and you can do whatever you want, but you still need to have at least that amount of constraints that, you know, is familiar for your brain to process. Yeah, yeah. Familiar to your, yeah, that's, that's a very good way to put it. Because, for example, with the, the Black Rock City, uh, which is the city of Burning Man, um, have you ever been actually, I asked? No, man. You've never been? <laughs> I'm, waiting, I'm waiting till my son is seven and then uh, me and Amit. Ah, I see. Come there, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. One will be there. <laughs> Great. I mean, so I bet I can bring you to the Oculus version of it. So it's called the virtual Black Rock and uh, on our space. And what's funny, what you said about just enough familiarity to know it, um, it's, it's what happens. Like Burning Man only happens for a week and... Uh, so when, it, when, it, when it's not happening, it's still somewhere in our brain. And because it's not happening for the first time this summer, you go in that, in that virtual reality space and it's, it's kind of weirdly familiar because somewhere in our brain, we, we have that city uh, that only happens for a week. Wow. So we don't compare it to something that exists. We compare it to our memories anyways. And so it's a, it's a funny thing. And I think Burning Man, strangely enough, was perfect for this exercise um, because it is lodged in our brain, not in reality. Tell me a little bit, of, uh, Arthur, about like, uh, you know, the, uh, the kind of talent that uh, Burning Man attracts. And uh, do you have relationships with those people uh, outside of the festival in terms of, you know, are they now collaborators or, you know, close friends or, uh, I mean, how does it work after the burn? I mean, it's pretty, pretty amazing, uh, like the kind of relationship you develop. Like I, I'll show I mean, you this got, one you picture. Got you. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so that relationship carried on. <laughs> yeah. But what's, what's really amazing is the amount of um, like harshness, let's say, that you experience in such a small period of time. So it's pretty crazy. I mean, just to show you that... The, the, the afterburn and how we kind of put all the, the steel together in little mounds and uh, and then we, 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 we send things for recycling and we, we're all like pretty 
in like it's really hard to that's my parents I, like uh, I definitely brought people that I was already connected to there but a lot of the people that we were at sort of extended that family because I, I can show you here we were dishwashing together we were cooking we had everything that one doesn't see in those images you know the, the sort of the press images is is like how community driven this is you know uh to give you a sense of scale this was our this was our oh, site man. right so we had our, our our camp you know galaxy is here but that's our camp and so in the camp you have things like um you know the the, the, the kitchen you have the i don't know if i have more images of the camp but just so picture this then picture the size of that right so <laughs> it was a proper village it was a proper village and and so and this is the construction site so this would give you a good sense of um of the size of the construction site. So every night we would stand on the table and tell our stories and say why we came there, why, what brought us there. So everyone would, uh, would, would tell us the very, very deep things, you know, very, very personal things. And, and in the sense that was really, really beautiful because um, it became about our life stories, our life journeys rather than, um, rather than like a construction site where you have a contractor and someone who builds uh, something for you because you pay them. It wasn't the case. It was, I built this because I lost my father. I built this because I, wow. I had a depression. I built this. And so people stand and say that. And, and, you know, I don't know if you read the, the book Homo Sapiens by uh, yeah. Harari. Yeah. Harari. Yeah, yeah, and he said that maybe, maybe communities maybe civilization was made the moment we decided to build things together uh maybe that those temples are the reason we created civilization because we were together building this because we had a purpose to complete a physical thing um and so and so that's probably what happens at burning man Every, they build the city so that's the build the city of uh, of burning man Black Rock City, and this is built in a week, uh, for a week, in a week, and 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 it's a city that's built around art, and art is from everyone. There's no spectator, there's no DJ uh, that is announced. It's like anyone could be a DJ showing up and doing things, and you become what you want to become because you have no barriers into becoming that. And so the roles are blurred and everyone being the artists create a weird fractal situation in which, you know, what does it mean to have a city that face the art if everything is art, which is why catharsis became that shape, you know, that, that shape here is, is a fractal in that it self references over and over so that there is no real center it's a multiplicity and infinity of centers, you see? Yeah. And so, so that's the amphitheater for a city that doesn't have spectators. And, and so in that sense, uh, you create bonds that are very horizontal. Like, and, and so the people that in that pictures, I mean, it's kind of funny, but the guy in the center here, he's, uh, he's, um, he's got a company in Bologna. They create... Um, they 3D print giant things. So you can see him there half naked and, and then I'll show you, uh, I don't know if it's the same person there, but that's their company. Oh, here you go. Now he's dressed up. Uh, they, they sell 3D printers. And, but, oh, wow. you know, if I tell you a company sells 3D printer, you think, oh, okay, that's a company that makes money out of selling machines. But the way I know them mm. is because they said, Arthur, we used Silkworm, the uh, open source plugin to create uh, the one that we, we, we developed uh, for 3D printing with G-code and they sent me a machine and they say, come and, come and visit us, I, but take your running shoes, take your running shoes. And I said, well, what, what do you mean? <laughs> and I spent the weekend there and he's like, okay, take your running shoes and let's go up. And then they started like running, we run together on the top of a mountain and he's like, Arthur, this is Shambhala. This is where we want to build our city made from the earth and that will disappear back to the earth. And that is Shambhala. And, and, and we were, I was just like, well, first I was really tired running our, you know, <laughs> all the way. And I was like, what the hell is going on here? And, uh, <laughs> and I don't know if you can see WASP, it says World's Advanced Saving Project, right? Wow. So, so, so they're, the reason they sell 3D printers Amazing. is because they want to build a village made of earth. 
and going back to the earth and uh, and they call it Shambhala and they're all Buddhists and uh, and that's why they created this company not to make money but to that's incredible that's develop an incredible. ideal yeah it's true and very inspiring and I find that often we think of capitalism in a way that that is profit driven right but I love the idea of a capitalism that is led by people who want to change the world and 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 create companies that are enabling that change and that's their driving force amazing story also because <laughs> it's as you said i mean I'm, I'm i can see both of you loving this conversation and i'm i'm so happy that i paired both of you guys together um i ask any final words or any final words no i had a thought on it uh, you know around uh, this is again maybe uh, it's just a thought to share with arthur to find out what he thinks about it like uh, you know one of the things is that uh, so uh, uh, so a little back stories i i uh, i went for this uh, vipassana meditation like a like a couple of years ago which is uh, the sort of 10 days of solitude uh, where you are not allowed to speak or uh, gesture or you know i mean essentially it's a vow of silence uh, across all your you know and it's like around say maybe 8 to 9 hours of meditation a day um and uh, the experience of uh, you know going through ni- uh, you know 9 or 10 days of that uh, it leaves you in a very uh, interesting space on the ninth day you know where uh, you sort of feel that you've glimpsed the workings of the universe you know it sort of uh, feels like at the end of the ninth day you're you're starting to see uh, what people do in those caves when they meditate for 14 years 15 years you know it's uh, very outside the imagination of uh, you know living a normal life uh, but uh i think there's a parallel manifested in working with generative software uh which essentially uh you know it squashes your ego i think that's the uh that's the sort of common experience between that meditation and working on something like rhino and grasshopper because uh, you you see the finiteness of your own brain uh, very clearly like you see the fact that you need augmentation or you need to be able to access a side of your uh you know of your psyche or your thinking uh in a way that allows you to vi- allows you to see the workings of the universe like allows you to look behind the curtain and see uh, what makes things work and you know i think fractals and holograms and uh this whole kind of uh you know there's a certain grammar there which kind of reveals itself to you again or maybe uh, you know on on psychedelics as well uh and there's a certain commonality in that uh you know so in fact why i shared that image of the lamp uh it was this uh, you know this club that we were designing back in 2006 called shroom and uh that club was pretty much conceived on psychedelics i mean the idea was to kind of get as close as possible to the you know uh to this transcendental kind of space that you experience when uh, you know you're on acid and uh, the point was to kind of melt uh, music and space and food and everything into one sort of a you know uh common experience and uh, so i mean I, yeah i just wanted to kind of leave that out there just wondering if you feel there's uh, when you're working at the burning man or when you're manifesting these kind of digital realities and uh, you know you're also immersed in a fairly virtual world uh, do you sense that you're seeing the workings of the universe like you feel uh, you're in creator mode uh, or i mean does that kind of resonate in any way wow the workings of the universe is <laughs> god I mean, a programmer <laughs> wow that's crazy i mean you know when you look at um, natural things right like when you walk down the i don't know if you do that too but i guess you have way more nature than we have here in in london but i can't help but stop and just look and feel like uh, there's so much to learn just just seeing these uh these natural things cuz you know they they how i mean who designed them right like and i think that's the question when you talk about god and what does design even mean if no one designed them and um and and what can we learn from their having no designers that have designed it and should we even use that word design anyways and 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 what you said about ego and and so i i don't know i i think like it's it's really important to think about this because we we are so obsessed and the idea of who designed what or 
um, has really made us a bit stuck and has brought so much ego in discussions about design that I almost wonder if we should reinvent that word and call it no sign or something, or maybe just say like by default we are, you know, or give design credit to the carpenter or to the, or remove, I don't know. I don't really have the answer, but all I know is that the more we accept that we are co-creating and that, that it's not just humans co-creating, the material is creating the, the behavior, the gravity is creating, the truck is creating because you're constrained by the size of the truck. So I think, yeah, I guess when you look at the, um, the assembly, the disassembly, the burning, the, the, the woods falling down, the people writing on things and hanging off something and reinventing the function of your space, which you couldn't think of because we're not such genius at the end of the day, you know, like you need an orchestra to play Beethoven. Right? Like it's, you can't just plug your computer to the brain of Beethoven, right? Like, <laughs> so I, I think actually maybe the more fractal we are, the more sponge-like we are, the closest we are to the lattice of the universe, that's for sure. <laughs>